Second Kings chapter 6, we'll read from verse 1. Second Kings chapter 6. It's a story we know very well from verse 1. It says, let's read together, one, two, go. And the sons of the prophets, they said to Elisha, see now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please, let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. And so he answered them, go. In verse 3, then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. And so he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But one, as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head it fell into the water and he cried out and he said alas master it was borrowed that man was in big trouble and so the man of God said look at this first it was Elisha in the beginning but by the time the trouble came and he went to go to Elisha Elisha was no longer Elisha. He had somehow transformed and he was now the man of God. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him where the place. So he, talking about Elisha, cut off a stick and threw it in the water. Now many things amaze me about this story. It was a river. The axe head fell in the river. One thing about rivers is that it flows. And so when Elisha is aiming at the place, he has no way of knowing that that stick that he's going to throw was going to land in the right place because the river is going to wash it away. And at this point in time, he just threw it in there. And what happened, he said, he made the axe, the iron, float. Iron does not float. In which world does iron float? But iron floated. And in verse 7, Elisha said to him, pick it up for yourself. He didn't say pick it up to yourself. He didn't say pick it up by yourself. He didn't say pick it up on behalf of yourself. He said pick it up, what? For yourself. Whatever it is that you stretch your hand out to reach is what you will get. We're going to be talking this morning about a season of disruptions. Is what we're going to talk about this morning. And I pray that God will help you understand that disruptions are good for life. Father, open our ears, open our hearts, open our eyes to see, hear, and receive a word from you. That your name indeed will be glorified and your church will be edified in everything that we will say, both now and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your seat. Take your seat. I was at a wedding over the, over the last few days. And we sat down at a table with a few of our friends. At the breakfast table, they were talking about a young family and they were saying that the wife was unhappy and every opportunity she had, she expressed her dissatisfaction with where she was living. And she said, the only reason I'm still in that town, I don't want to mention the name of the town because it might offend some but they are known for growing potatoes more than anything else. You figure that out. <laughs> and she said, I'm not happy being here. 
But the only reason I stay here is because of my husband. And they said, what does your husband do? And they said, a husband is also a physician. We said, but there are physician jobs everywhere. Anywhere you go to, a physician will find a job. She was also a physician, but she had quit her job because she was not happy. And she said, I'm technically going into depression. She said, I'm not happy. We talked about it for a little bit. And we came to the conclusion. And I said to her, I said, sir, the day that you decide you have had enough, that is the day both you and your family will relocate. I said, because if you decide that I'm not doing this again, whatever it is that that other past person is finding outside, when they come home and they lose joy and sleep and peace at home, they will move. The first thing I want to tell you this morning, write this down, is that when your pain becomes bigger than your fear, when the pain that you are feeling is bigger than the fear or the concern that you have, you will move. Change will come. It all depends on you. If you are still where you are today, it is because you allow it to happen. My mom used to tell us, don't complain about anything that you allow to happen. And it is scriptural. Genesis 27 in verse 40. It's scriptural. Genesis chapter 27 in verse 40. They told the boy, he said, you will continue to serve your brother. You will live by the sword. But it will come to pass. When you become restless, then you will make changes. You see, it is not the change that you make that resolves the restlessness. You have to become restless on the inside of you in order to make any change on the outside. The restlessness happens in between your ears. You can be physically sitting down peaceful, but as soon as you become restless, that's when you make changes. The Bible says, when I was a child, I behaved like a child. But when I became a man, I put aside childish things. He became a man and he put aside childish things. He did not become a man because he put out childish things. He became a man because he became a man on the inside of him before he was able to put out childish things. I'm praying for you today that you will find the grace, the strength, and the courage to make the changes that are necessary in life. Do I hear amen? I want to talk this morning about what I have called the disruption of change. The disruption of change. You see, changes will occur in life whether you like them or yes. I woke up this morning and as I was heading out of the home, I heard geese in my backyard. If you are from Chicago, you know what it means when you hear geese. Geese fly on the edge of the cold and the warm weather. You will never find geese where it is freezing and you will never find them where it is boiling. They always fly on the edge. So it told me that something is changing in the atmosphere. The season is moving along. I told my wife, she laughed and says, oh God, not again. But I said, to her, I said, whether you like it or yes, the seasons will change. Many of us are dissatisfied with where we are. We have this love-hate relationship with change. You don't like where you are. You want to do something different. But there's something that we need to get past. And that is the courage to get the change that is necessary. Children go off to school. All these children that we just prayed for, clapped for, saluted. When they get home after they're gone, their parents will have an empty seat at the table. And all of a sudden, a young family that had two people at the table will suddenly now have only one. You miss them, but at the same time, you're happy for them to go. So whichever way, that change will come on you. I told them in the morning the story about when my first daughter went off to college. We dropped her in school. And she said, bye-bye. And we got into the car and we were driving. Ten minutes outside, she called my, my wife and said, Mom, you left me. You left me. And she was crying. And I looked at my wife. She too was crying. And she said, let's go back. Let's go back. I said, we can go back now. She said, but after we go back in five minutes, we will still leave her there again. So whatever will happen to her in that time, let it happen and it continues to go inside here. Whether you like it or yes, change will happen. 
I told someone the other day, I went running. And by the time I came back, my knees were hurting. And I said to him, I said, getting old sucks. Because no matter how good you look, you will age. It is a way of life. And so the things I used to do, get up, run, and go, it doesn't happen that way again. I'm trying to build a six-pack. My daughter and I have a challenge. I'm serious. Many of us that are working on our one-pack, you need to change your plan. You know the one-pack? Leave that one alone. But there's a challenge that comes with change. There's a challenge that comes along with change. Elisha was stepping into big shoes. He was stepping into the shoes of Elijah. Elijah had put those people together. And all of a sudden, they were now going to Elisha and asking him, what do we do? This is the first time that we're hearing from Elisha that he's going to do something. You see, in life, we need wisdom to navigate some of the challenges that we're going to see. Change is good, but it comes with challenges. Being married is a good thing because everybody should be married. But there are challenges with being married. Now, all of a sudden, you can't pick up your bag and go. You have to think about what your spouse is going to eat or what your spouse is going to need. And you have to think about the different things. You have to, have to, you have to now plan for two people instead of you. Being married is good, but it comes with its challenges. Becoming parents is a good thing. But there's more to being a parent than being a niece or an auntie or a nephew or a cousin to someone. Because all of a sudden, you have to wake up at night to, to feed the child. You have to wake up in the morning to change the diaper. I was talking to one of my friends in the back. And I asked him, I said, why were you late? He said, Pastor, as we were about to leave home, my baby, we had to go back and change her because she went to the toilet. I said, you mean you couldn't tell her what to do? Being a parent comes with these challenges. When you get a new job, it's a good thing, but it also comes with these challenges. When you are at the point where you have mastered everything that you needed or knew with the old job, then all of a sudden change comes along. I told someone a while ago that life will always promote you to a position of incompetence. When you know exactly everything that you need to know about one job, then they will look at you and say, you are so good at it. And then they will move you to another job where you know nothing. Has it happened to anybody here before? Life will always promote you to the position of incompetence. And this is why I talk about the disruption of change. The Bible says that the sons of the prophet, they went to Elisha. This place where we live is too small for us. They were looking for promotion, increase, expansion, multiplication. That's all they were looking for. Now, let me tell you this carefully. Anytime that you pray to God for change, God answers with disruption. It follows. Now, I will tell you this carefully and I want you to write this down. Don't let the disruption become a distraction. Because life as you know it will be disrupted. And many people will now focus on fixing the disruption and not learn the lesson or the promotion that should be coming from the disruption. Because in life, without disruption, you cannot have promotion. You cannot have change. You cannot have increase. Go and ask anybody who has had a baby. All the ladies that have had babies. There is a disruption that comes in the beautiful shape that you have. And something changes. You cannot have a baby without the change coming to your body structure. If you plant a seed in the ground, It will disrupt the earth before it will grow. You cannot have a change of any type. The amount of change that you will be able to handle is announced by the volume of the disruption that you will get. So if your life is upside down right now and you are going through all sorts of turmoil, I celebrate with you because God is getting you ready for something. Help you tap your neighbor on the shoulder and tell them, it's going to be okay. There's a fence in my house, I was telling them. When I sit down in my living room, I look at the fence. There's a tree that is growing right in my house there. The tree is growing, but the fence that held the tree in before, the fence is now leaning over. And I was thinking to myself, 
what are we going to do about this fence? Because surely we're not going to do anything about the tree. The tree must continue to grow. It is the fence that we have to do something about. I pray for somebody here today. Whatever fence has been around you, whatever glass ceiling is over your life, whatever containment is holding you where you are, may the growth that God has given you push it out of the way. You see, what I want you to know is that you must handle the disruptions. What did I say? Handle the disruptions. Don't pray for change if you cannot handle disruption. Don't pray for change. Don't focus on settling the disruption because that is what God is going to use to move you along. We're talking about this season of change. And one thing I want you to understand is that because you are doing the right thing for yourself, for your church, for your family, it does not mean that life will cooperate with you. It does not. When you read the story of Nehemiah, go to Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10. There are two guys in Nehemiah in chapter 2. Sambalat and Tobias. Nehemiah decided that the walls of the city had broken down. And he wasn't doing it for himself. He was doing it for the whole of Israel. He went to the king that he was serving. He got permission from the king to go and rebuild the fence. The king not only gave him permission, also wrote him letter of recommendation. After the king wrote him letter of recommendation, the king also gave him money, resources, and gave him vacation. He said, how much time do you need? He told him. He said, go. Anytime you finish, your job will still be waiting for you. Then he got to the people that he was going to help. The people that he was going to work with. And in verse 10, the Bible says, When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, the officials that were in the city, when they heard of it, they were greatly disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. How is it possible that all you are looking for is to do good and life will not cooperate with you? This is what I talk about handling the disruptions of change. Let me say this and tell you carefully. In the game of life, life will always throw curved balls at you. And I had to go and look at it when they say life will throw curve balls. What does it mean for life to throw curve balls? In baseball, when you watch the pitcher pitching the ball towards the guy who is going to strike the ball. There are different ways that he holds the ball. And he will pitch in such a way that they call it a curve ball. There's one they call it a power curve. There's one they call a knuckle curve. There's one they call a 12 to 6 curve. Depending on who it is, if it's a left-handed batter, they use a power curve. If it's a right-handed batter, they use the knuckle curve. But there's one that works for both right-handed people and left-handed people. It's called the 12 to 6 curve. The ball comes, waves, and goes in an S. I said, is that possible? And I went to look for myself. I challenge you to go online and do the same thing. That when life will throw a curveball at you, you have to be determined that no matter what life throws at you, you're going to stand behind it and hit that ball the only way that God will enable you. Do I hear amen? You would think that man was doing the right thing, but his axe head fell. And he would have been asking, why is it when it is my turn that the axe head had to fall? There are many of us that are cutting here. Why is it my own that should fall? Why did God allow it to happen to me? Why did God even allow it to happen at all? Look at your hands. Let me see your hands up. This is not a trick question. Please tell me which of your fingers are equal. None of your fingers are equal. The question is, why is one shorter than the other? It is because God has a design in them. 
The race that you are running is different than the race that I am running. The challenges that you will face are different than the challenges that I will face. And so when you go along, don't look at the person beside you, how they are running their own race. Because they may be running at 200 meters and you are running a marathon. They may be running a 100 meter sprint and you are running the 800 meters. Don't compare yourself to anybody that is beside you. Run your own race. Tap your neighbor for me and tell them, run your own race. disruptions there will always be opportunities in disruptions always comes with opportunities because every disruption will present an opportunity for a promotion for an increase for a positive change and in one of the ironies of life poor people think that rich people don't have disruptions because they have so much and rich people think poor people don't have disruptions because they don't have anything to be disrupted that is not true the rain falls equally upon the just and the unjust and in any event no amount of money you have can buy peace no matter how much money you have you cannot buy peace peace is not available to be bought i was talking to one of my young friends the other day and she was she was saying to me that pastor i thank god that he has made me good looking he said, but now it is a difficult problem and it's a different problem. I said, why? He said, because everywhere that I go now, I have now been objectified. And every time people look at me, then they're not hearing the content of my brain, but they are looking at the physical container in which I come. In other words, she's so pretty that nobody thinks of her as anything intelligent. And I said to her, I said, what a good problem to have. She said, what do you mean? I said in life, people will never be satisfied. Fat people want to get slim. Slim people want to get fat. Tall people want to get short. Short people want to get tall. Every which way that you go. And I said to her, I said, so now you will see someone who will say, if only I was better looking, if only I was more handsome, I would be able to get things in life. Because go and look at all the entertainers. All of them are good looking. Osha is good looking. Jay-Z is good looking. Beyonce is good looking. All of them are good looking. But there are some of them that are not good looking. I won't mention names, but you know them. Perhaps the issue is that you are trying to do many of these things by yourself. And so today, I want to encourage you, don't do anything by yourself. I was talking to my nephew the other day and he said, just like somebody else, he said, I am tired of being stuck in this dead-end job. I know that I am more than this. And I want to do more for myself. I want to do more than what I am doing now. And I said to him, I said, in order to get better than where you are now, it is a series of steps. It is layer upon layer, principle upon principle. You didn't get where you are overnight. It is unlikely that you are going to win the lottery in order to get you out immediately. How many people win a lottery in a lifetime? In your lifetime, how many people have you known that win lotteries compared to the number of people that are alive? This is why I want to talk about big moments and small moments. Maybe you are thinking that all the things that you're doing now will not be able to get you to the place that you want to go. Don't think like that again. What I want to challenge you is look back. When I look back over my life and I look at many of the decisions that I have made, there are some of them that I know are big decisions. Coming to the United States many moons ago was big. Coming to pastor this church many moons ago was big. Resettling in this place where we are was big. But in between those big decisions, there have been many small decisions that we have had to make. And it is those small decisions that position us and put us in a place where we can make the big decisions. And unless you make those small decisions on time, it becomes difficult. Let me say this to you carefully. A difficult decision is only a combination of small things that you did not do on time. There's nothing that is hard or too big. It is only a combination of small things that you didn't do on time that become large and then becomes a challenge. When you do it on time, it is never much. 
It looks like small things, but each one as you do and you get along with them, it positions you for the place where you need to be. As we go on, I'm looking at you and I want to tell you this. You need to be deliberate about everything you do going forward. The ladies went on a boat cruise in Chicago recently and they, they had lunch on a boat on the river. When they started out, they started at the Navy Pier and it sailed out. At some point in time, the boat began to turn and turn and turn and turn until it came back to the dock. Those that were on the boat were still having a good time. They were still eating. They were still dancing. They were still enjoying themselves. But somewhere along the line, the boat began to change directions. Gently, slowly, but deliberately until it got to where it was supposed to go. It's the same thing that you need to do. Don't wait until you have to make a huge decision at one point in time. If the captain of that boat had not made the small adjustments that he needed to be making, he would have had to make a huge adjustment at some point in time to avoid them from running out. Then he turns the boat sharp. Then everybody on board the boat then knows that something has happened. And that is where you say you rock the boat. In life, you have to be deliberate and make small changes and make small turns so that you don't have to make all the many huge decisions that will rock the boat. As we go on ahead, I want to tell you as I close today, that everybody who has had a big step up with God has always had what I call a mountaintop experience. A mountaintop experience. I'll give you examples and we can go through with them. Throughout scripture, everybody has a divine or a mountaintop experience that they go through. Genesis in chapter 1. Genesis chapter 12, sorry. The Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country. Get out of your family. And get out of your father's house. And go to a place that I will show you. Until he encountered God. He was already rich. He was already great. But until he had that encounter with God. It was then that God then unleashed upon him. The seven blessings. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless everyone that blesses you, curse everyone that curses you, and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It took a divine encounter for that to happen. When you read Jonah in chapter 1 in verse 1, Jonah in chapter 1 in verse 1, the Bible says clearly in Jonah in chapter 1 in verse 1, it said, God told Jonah, the son of Amitab, he said, go, go here. Before that time that the word of God came to Jonah, nobody knew anything about Jonah. But today, both Christian and non-Christian alike, we know about Jonah. If you look again in Jonah chapter 3 verse 1, Jonah chapter 3 verse 1, God again appeared to Jonah. The Bible says again, a second time, the word of the Lord came again to Jonah the second time telling him what to do. I pray for you today that God will send a word to you. I was sharing with the church the other day when I said that Simon walked on water. Simon did not walk on water. Simon walked on the revelation of the word that he had. It was on the word that he worked. Look at Simon Peter in Luke in chapter 4. Simon Peter was a successful businessman. And I want to say this so that all the people that are in business can hear me and hear me clearly today. Simon Peter was a successful businessman. He was a leader of the fleet. He had resources. And they had been working and working and working. And the Bible says, in the morning, after they had worked, he said they caught nothing. In Luke chapter 5 in verse 4. And Jesus Christ showed up to him. And Jesus told him on that day, he said, launch out into the deep and let down your net. There are things that God will tell you to do that will not make sense. But if it is God, you will know the voice of God when God is telling you to do things. And God told him by divine encounter, 
go and do the things that I am about to tell you to do. Today, I'm praying for you that you will have a divine encounter with God. Samuel, in the days of the prophet Eli, three times Samuel was sleeping and someone woke him up and he said Samuel Samuel he got up and ran to Pastor Eli and Eli told him I'm not the one calling you go back and sleep I didn't call you he woke up a second time because he had another voice calling him Samuel Samuel the attentive young man woke up again in his sleep and ran to the man of God. And the man of God told him, I didn't call you. The first time he had Saul, he had Eli. The second time he had the man of God. The third time when he woke up, he still had someone calling him. And he told him, Samuel, he woke up again and he went to God the third time. He went to Eli the third time and Eli then recognized that if you are hearing something and it is coming repeatedly into your head, he said go back and lay down he said when you hear that voice again he said I, I, say, talk to God and say speak Lord for your servant is listening, I'm praying today that God will speak to every one of you I pray that God will open your ears to know that it is him that is speaking I pray that God will leads you on to know the difference between the voice of a man and the voice of God. I want to stop this morning, this afternoon as the case may be. I want us to pray for a few minutes one with the other. In the scripture we read, the Bible says that the sons of the prophet, they went to Elisha to ask him for help. I want you to put your hands on the shoulder of the person next to you. Please find someone that you can help, that you can pray with today. Shoulders are where you bear load. Shoulders is what you carry work with. Shoulders, when you see a man who has broad shoulders, they say he looks strong. Isn't that true? Today, you want to pray that this person on whose hands you're resting, on whose shoulders you're resting your hand, will not have to carry their load by themselves again. In Psalm 68, in verse 1, the Bible says, Let God arise and let his enemies, let them do what? Let them scatter. I want you to pray for that person and say, My Father, my Father. Or pray that along with me this morning. My Father, my Father. I pray for this, your child, on whose shoulders. I'm resting my hands. Carry their load for them. Carry their burden for them. Don't leave them alone. Don't let them carry the burden by themselves. Don't leave them to their own devices. Lift them up in your own way. Lift them up beyond their strength. Lift them up beyond their imagination. In the name of Jesus Christ. Go ahead and pray for them. Say whatever challenge it is that you're carrying. Whatever load it is that you have. I pray today that the Lord Almighty will send someone to carry it for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, my Lord and my God. For it is in Jesus' marvelous name we have prayed. Say it loud and a better, Amen. The Bible says the sons of the prophet, they went to Elisha. But it was the prophet, the man of God, that answered them. David said in Psalm 70, he said every time he prays, he asks God to hurry up and help him. I want you to pray for yourself for one minute this afternoon. That God will hurry up and help you. Show me Psalm 70. Show me Psalm 70 this morning. Psalm 70 verse 1. Three times in five verses, Samuel told, um, David told God, hurry up. You would have thought God would tell David, what do you know about timing? I decide what I want to do. But God did not tell him, shut up. God did not tell him, what are you talking about? But instead, God answered him. 
I want you to pray like this after me. Say, my father, my father. Say it loud and clear. My father, my father. Make haste, oh God. Make haste. Make haste to help me. Hurry up to deliver me. Hurry up to, to serve your purpose in my life. Hurry up, almighty God. And what you purpose to do in my life, do it today. Whatever disruption you send along my way, help me to learn from it. Help me to learn through it. Help me to learn by it in the name of Jesus Christ. Talk to God and say, my father, my father, no disruption will change the path of life that you have planned for me in the name of Jesus Christ. No disruption will sway me away from the path of life that you have planned for me in the name of Jesus Christ. My children will not fall on the wayside. My life will not fall on the wayside. My parents will not fall on the wayside. My siblings will not miss it because of disruptions in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, my Lord and my God. For it is in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Say it louder and better. Amen. Help me tell your neighbor as we stop today. Disruptions will not change your life. Tell the other person, disruptions will only push you further. If you believe that, say amen. amen. This is a season of change. And I pray the God of change will work for you. Have you been blessed today? It is time for us to bless God. It is time for us to bless God with his tithe and our offering. I was telling the 